today. Um, so as the penultimate speaker for today, I think my objective really is just to, to whet your appetite around this blockchain distributed ledger direct technology and really leave you, leave you thinking about what opportunities out, are out there. I mean, there's a lot of ideas and we can you know, throw some around, but I think you know, as, as prop techs, that's what really excites me because you are the guys that are really going to be able to enable these, these opportunities. You know, we're, as ASX, and I'll talk about this in a minute, we've built a, a platform that is an enabler for creating use cases for distributed ledger technology, but we don't have all the ideas. So it's really out there for innovators to start thinking about what can I use this technology for? And we'll, we'll go through some of that today. Uh, we'll be clicking quite a bit. Um, so just to give you some insight, uh, five years ago, the ASX made an ambitious move to replace CHESS, which is the clearing and settlement system for the Australian equities market. And you only change this infrastructure every 20 years. It's critical market infrastructure. It's not something you, you, know, you just change and swap out very quickly. But when you do change it, you want to make sure it's going to take you for the next 20 years. So it was an ambitious idea to say, well, why don't we look at this blockchain technology and see how we can not only implement what we've got today, the capability, but also look at how we can take friction out of, of markets, specifically the, the capital, capital markets. So how can we allow players and innovators in the marketplace actually participate in what we do and build new, new ways of interacting with each other? So we went on this, this um, search worldwide looking for this technology and we adopted a few partners and I'll talk a little bit about what this technology looks like. Um, so, so firstly, before I show this, um, when you think about blockchain, you probably think about Bitcoin, you think about Ethereum. Um, this is sort of the roots um, of blockchain or the first use of it was an implementation of Bitcoin. But what we really want to focus is on is the underlying technology, which is the blockchain itself. So we're not going to be discussing crypto at all, at all today. But one thing we did learn is that Bitcoin and Ethereum are what we call public permissionless ledgers. Now, when you think about critical infrastructure or looking at enterprise level application of this technology, you can't necessarily go public. You don't want everyone to see your data. And you also want to control you can't have everyone being anonymous on the, on the infrastructure as well. You want to control who has access and what they can do. So over the last four years, the technology is involved in what we call private permission ledgers. And private permission ledgers have been built specifically with the same underlying blockchain, but they have different non-functional requirements. They're focused on scalability, security, performance, identity, all those things that you would expect to work in either a regulated or just generally in, in, common, in, in common enterprise. So the best way to explain how this technology works, and um, just, I guess, full disclosure in terms of my background, I, over the last four years, have been focused primarily on, on this technology, but my background's actually in, in commercial property. Um, so I was the former managing director for Cougar Software and MRI Software in Australia for, for eight years. So I, I'm quite passionate about how the use of this technology can actually solve a whole lot of problems in the, in the property space. So when you think about the ecosystem, and this is an example of commercial property ecosystem, um, you have many different participants in an ecosystem. And they all share, share data. Now, everyone has their own way of storing their data. So think about the uh, property manager. They have a leasing system that the lease sits in. The asset manager has a property management system um, the fund manager you know, stores all the fund information and the tenant you know, uh, also stores information. And a typical bit of information that you share is a lease. So in the case of a property manager, the property manager stores the, the main lease. But you think about when the lease contract actually started, it would have been some sort of paper agreement. It would have gone between the tenant and the property manager and the asset manager and the lease would have been signed. And when that lease gets signed, it gets manually entered into the property manager's leasing system. It gets manually entered into the asset management system, unless they happen to be on the same system. The fund manager wants a copy because um, you know, they want to look at what the impact's going to be on the fund's cash flow. The tenant takes a copy and puts it in their filing cabinet. And every now and then, the valuer wants a, company so they can, a copy so they can revalue the property. And then you might have things like insurers who also want to see what's being committed. So this is what it looks like today. It's the same bit of information, 
that gets disseminated to all these different, different participants. And then what happens at some stage during the lease, the lease will change. Now, the problem is not everyone gets informed of the change. The change is probably updated in the property management system. It may make its way to the asset manager. The tenant may have a, a, a draft of the change but never actually got the final change. The fund manager probably doesn't get it at all and the valuator, valuer wasn't even aware that the change happened. So that's a real, a real problem. You never, you never really understand what the data looks like, where, where the real data is and where the source of truth of this data is. So what that really creates is a reconcil reconciliation nightmare. Now ideally all these systems would be reconciling together, but some of them do, but most of them, most of them don't. So the, the key problems here are synchronisation, that it's very manual, that the data can't be relied on and it not, not, can't necessarily be trusted. So this is when we start to introduce how can blockchain and distributed ledger help in a situation like this. So just talking about the evolution of a ledger, the first ledger is a simple filing cabinet. You put a lease in a filing cabinet and it's ordered by, by, by property name or, or something like that. And, sorry, I think it's a bit, I can move it down. Shall I just move it down a bit? I'm not sure if it's down. I think it actually might be hitting, I think it's hitting your... I'll put it in my shirt. I'll put it there, shall I? Let just change that one. Sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Okay, is that better? Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay, so there has been a bit of an evolution from the basic filing cabinet. Um, many years ago, obviously, we dematerialised, things became digital, and the lease would end up in a, in a database. So in most days today, people don't store stuff in filing cabinets, they store it in databases. The problem with the database is, one, as I described before, everyone has their own version of database. And two, the database is not immutable. So when you look at that database, you can't prove that someone hasn't tampered with that data. How do you know it's the latest copy that you have at any point in time. Um, it also, what it doesn't tell you is history. So say the lease changed partway through, unless you've got an audit on every single field within that database, you can't tell what changed and when it changed. All you're seeing is what you would call the latest state or the latest state of the lease. So then we introduce this technology around blockchain and let's see how it can address, because blockchain is, it is really a database, it's just a very, a very smart database. So just breaking down what a, what a blockchain is, and I'll try and keep it quite simple. Every time you have a transaction, say for instance a lease gets created, it gets, the transaction gets written, and every few transactions a block gets created. And what a block is, is a way of making this data immutable. So essentially what it does is it gets all those transactions, it bundles them together, it applies some cryptography to it, take it off, you apply some cryptography to it, which we call a hash, and you sign that hash with a key, and what that does is ensures that if anyone was to go to change any of that information within the block, the hash would actually change. So it's a way of proving that that data has not changed. So that's the first benefit over a, a blockchain. Can you just say all that again real fast, please? <laughs> <laughs> so my slide disappeared here as well. So what it does is it takes Every transaction, so it could be an initial lease being created, and there could be a lease being, uh, a, a date, like say the lease end date is changing. So every time there's a change, it writes every change, every update that happens to that, in this case a lease. And then what it does is every X number of transactions, it, cr it bundles them together, and it applies a cryptographic algorithm to it that says, this cryptographic algorithm will produce a hash, a long string, and that string represents the contents of that block. If you were to change one little bit of that block and reapply that algorithm, you would not get the same hash. But if, you would, if nothing changed and you reapplied the algorithm, you'd get the same hash all the time. So if someone was to go and tamper with that block, you would know because the hash has changed. And you've got something to compare the hash against? Uh, well, that's where we're going. So, yeah. Good, good, good pick up. Okay. So what happens is you then, every now and then you create a block and then you, more transactions come in. So you create more blocks. 
But the thing is, you want to make sure that those transactions are all related to each other and they're all ordered properly. So this is the idea of a chain. So what happens here is a new block gets created, but when the new block gets created, part of the new block is actually the hash it created in the previous block. So it takes that hash, it combines it with the transactions in the new block, and it creates a new hash. And then it does it again and again and again. So if you were to go and actually change a previous transaction, you'd actually, it would change the hash, but then it would actually impact every other block. So the only way to change it is you'd actually have to recalculate the hash for every block up until today. It's, it's tamper resistant, but it's not tamper proof. You could, you could do it. And thanks for the lead in, because that's what we're about to discuss. So it is immutable. It does have, unlike a database, it's immutable. It provides an audit trail. So in this example here, I could go back and say, when the address changed at block, what, block height two, whatever it is, show me what the address was there, or show me what the address was at block height three. It keeps track of every single event, not just the state it looked like today. You can also play it, play it back, so you can actually look at what did, what did the lease look like you know, at block height whatever, not just what it looks like today. So now we start talking about distributed ledgers. So blockchain is just a component of a distributed ledger. And the reason we distribute ledgers is, as you picked up, it's tamper resistant but not tamper proof. So I could, I could potentially, if, I have, if everyone shares that same blockchain, someone could go and change it. And if they're clever enough and could recalculate the hashes, it's possible to recalculate it. So what you then introduce is a distributed ledger. You don't have one chain. You create multiple of them and you distribute them. So in this case, we've got what we call four nodes or four, it's the same data replicated four times. So in order to change, and what happens is every time you write a transaction, it writes it independently to each one of those nodes and it forms a block. And then what they do is that bit in the middle consensus, they all compare, compare with each other and said, did we all get the same hash? Have we all got the same result? If we have, we commit the transaction. So that's the consensus protocol. In the case of Byzantine fault tolerant consensus, which is the one that, that we use at the ASX, you only need three out of the four nodes to actually respond. So what that also gives you is fault tolerance. So if one of those nodes for some reason is unavailable, the system stays alive. So in the case of, with databases, you normally need a DR scenario. Your database goes down. You have to then go to another data center, go to a backup. You may lose some data. In this case, you would actually, the data is replicated four times. These nodes are geographically separated. So if you have some sort of you know, um, issue in a particular area, you, ideally they'd be further enough spread apart that it won't impact all those nodes. Um, and if one is impacted, the others continue to function and you don't lose your data. When it comes back online, it just catches back up. So it gives you a really high level of fault tolerance. So you don't actually need a DR site because it's, it's actively keeping everything current and alive. So that's your, your distributed ledger. But the challenge with this is the distributed ledger has, holds all data. Now, you don't want to give all data to everyone. Now, as we talked about before, part of the reason why everyone has their own database is because they want to build their own applications on top of their data. Now, you may say, well, you can use software as a service, use a, you know, a hosted provider. But the problem is the data is sitting on their system, and a lot of uh, participants are reluctant to build new applications on top of someone else's data or someone else's infrastructure. So what we do is we introduce, because it's distributed, we introduce the, the idea of client nodes. So what a client node is, it's a sharded view of that ledger. So every time a change is made to the ledger, based on whose permission to see it, that data will be pushed out to a node that is that resides in the custody of the participant. So in this case, the property manager will have their own node, their own sharded view or subset of that blockchain, which just has their data in it, and they get informed on every single chain. But they've got a way of proving that if that data is always the same as the data that exists within the, the core blockchain. And what happens is every participant has their own version of that. So what this does is it creates an opportunity for all these participants to start building applications on top of what is now their data. So instead of everyone having separate databases that you can't trust the data and you have to reconcile, this basically facilitates the automatic synchronization of all, of all data. 
And once you have that and you trust the data, then it really creates the opportunity to innovate on top of it. So that's the sort of core properties of a distributed, distributed ledger. It gives you high availability, eliminating reconciliation. There's so much cost in, in reconciliation. And, and, and also the third one is around privacy. So you're only seeing the data that you, you should see, you, can, you should be able to see. So it's not just about pushing data around because if everyone just pushes, creates their own data and pushes it around, no one else can understand it and interpret it. So you have to come up with some standards. And that's where we introduced the concept of a smart contract. And essentially, if you think about a lease today, and we're talking about a commercial lease, I would call that a, a dumb contract because essentially you, know, you sign a lease, it's got all these clauses, all these terms and conditions, break clauses, exercise options, and no one really polices that or it's very difficult to police what you can do and can't do on a lease. So you really need something that's, that's much smarter. So the concept of a smart contract, it really, it really does th three different functions. The first one is tokenization. You probably all have heard of the term tokenization. Essentially, tokenization is coming up with a standard. So if you took a lease contract and you had standard attributes or fields within that lease and standard use of those fields, that's an example of, of tokenizing a lease contract. And once you tokenize something and everyone understands the properties of it, you can then distribute it amongst all those participants and then they can start building applications on top of it. The advantage is that if you define the schema or the token structure within a smart contract, and then you want to go and make changes to that schema, you can actually request the network to approve the change. So you can have another version of it and everyone will approve that. And once it gets approved, you can then roll that out and everyone agrees with it. The second part is rules and control. So as I talked about, you know, there's options, how do you exercise and break clauses. You can automate these because you codify the rules in a smart contract. So if the, the tenant, for instance, wants to, wants to break the lease, they would actually put a request into the distributed ledger. It would be a smart contract request saying, I want to break the lease. And the smart contract is smart enough to know who can break the lease and some rules around when you can or can't break it and who needs to approve it as well. If it needs to be approved by the property manager, it would be distributed to the property manager to, order, to facilitate that approval. And the third bit is the permissions. So based on what I just said now, it's about access rights. So if you've got a lease, who can see it? You know, if you've got an insurer that's been added to the network, can the insurer see it? What leases can they see? So it allows the, the custody of the data to be controlled by those who, who own the data and also the ability to revoke that data as well. So if the data is in the network, you can provide it to someone, but also you can, you can stop that tap as well so the data doesn't go any further. I'll push ahead because there's a bit to get through and I don't know how I'm going for time. Um, so in terms of use cases this, for this technology, in its simplest form, we start to think about inter-organisational workflows. So within an organisation, you may have multiple departments and the departments want to have, build a workflow between them. The most practical and I guess the most value-added use case is industry-based use cases. So if you can, like the example I just showed you, if you can get an industry that they may, there are multiple participants that are known to the network but not necessarily trusted by each other, this is a great opportunity to build these type of workflows because the smart contract really controls who does what. It's all stored in the blockchain. Everyone who needs to have access can see the data and they all trust it. So it's all about, you don't have to trust who you're dealing with, you just have to trust the system is gonna manage that, that permissioning that has been coded within the smart contract. The third area um, is track and trace. So you would have heard there's, there's a lot of examples around provenance because it's immutable. So, you know, example of from paddock to plate. So if you've got something from the farm gate, you can track it. You can have different participants, like it gets on a truck, the courier company will, you know, record the temperature readings of the fridge as it's curing it all the way to the retailer. And you've actually got the ability to track something that's been produced all the way back to its inception. Um, we have actually just on our platform gone live, and you can probably look it up, KPNG in conjunction with New South Wales Government and Mervac has built a building assurance um, app, which has, similar to what was explained today, a star rating. Um, it produces a, a quality index for residential towers. And what it does is it tracks all the components in the, in the building from the manufacturer all the way through to who's actually installed the component. 
And once you have all that information, you can then you know, kick, um, introduce things like maintenance schedules and everything, everything gets recorded and you can disseminate that out to different participants in that ecosystem. The next area is around a register of digital assets. So once you've got a digital asset that's registered, so examples would be a lease is a digital asset, but you've got things like representation of property, like land titles um, and identity, and then you've got um, NFT. So we're talking about non-fungible. Non non-fungible non essentially means unique. So anything that's unique can be held on there. And then once you hold it on a, digit on a distributed ledger, and it could be a public one or a private one, you can then allow different things to happen to it. Like you can trade them, you can sell them, um, you can, you can uh, you know, break, break them down into, into components. Um, uh, you can, um, oh, my screen just keeps disappearing. Oh, I'll go from here. Okay. It disappeared. Um, so, and then the, the last one is digital, digital currencies. So they're fungible. Uh, there's a whole lot of work being done with the Reserve Bank at the moment around central bank digital currencies. And the reason we need a digital currency or a stable coin is that when you've got assets on a register, a lot of times they involve some sort of DVP, some sort of exchange for cash in some form. You have to make the cash digital, which then allows for you to do an atomic transaction. And that will ha happen, you think about property, about conveyancing. If all this is all in the one ledger, if the property title's on the one ledger, the, the digital currency that it's been traded with is on one ledger, then you can form an atomic transaction and it guarantees that you know, it will be, the transaction will be finalised. Um, so just a bit more about the, the platform or the infrastructure that I'm talking about. Um, the, the one we're using is called ASX um, Symphony. Um, and essentially it's a partnership between the ASX, VMware and Digital Asset. Um, so ASX's role is primarily operating the infrastructure. And the reason you need an operator is everyone says that you, know, you want to de-intermediate blockchains, that you shouldn't have an intermediary in the middle. The problem is if you transfer $100 to someone and it's meant to go to someone else, how do you get that back? Everyone wants a rule book. So that's primarily the role that we play. We operate the infrastructure, but we also provide the rule book that when something goes wrong, there's some sort of recourse. And then we have our infrastructure um, blockchain provider, which is VMware, and Digital Asset is the smart contracting language that, that we use. So how does it look? Um, what we start with is you need, you need participants, you need plumbing. So to create an ecosystem, it's, you know, there's a lot of use cases around blockchain where people come up with ideas. It could be a, a shopping centre and a bank. They come up with an idea that they're going to interact together. And they, they do a proof of concept and it all works really well. The problem is they then go out and say, how do we get more shopping centres to join? And how do we get more banks to join? And the, and the other banks say, we're not joining yours because you know, who's going who's gonna to run the rule book? So they end up setting up a consortium, which is another organisation that controls the rules. And that is successful. But then they have a single use case. So it's much easier to bring a use case to an active ecosystem than it is to try and create an ecosystem around a single use case. So essentially what we're doing is we're creating the plumbing. So we're gonna have, you know, when the chess project goes live, there'll be thousands of participants already connected to it. All the plumbing's connected, so everyone knows how to interact with the ledger. And then it really just creates opportunities for those to innovate on top of it. Um, so this is an example, the chess equity register. We're building the register, the clearing and settlement function, but the industry will build the registry function, the back office functions, the, the company secretarial functions. We're currently building a superannuation registry with, with Grow, Grow Inc. Um, and, and fund managers are going to connect to that, custodians are going to connect to that. There's a private equity register, register being built. Um, there's a whole lot of work around energy and carbon tracking. Um, as I said, Mervac's already gone live with the with the building, building assurance app. So there's heaps of opportunities out there. I don't have a lot of the property ones on this slide, but I think, it, I think with this area, it's really just thinking about, you know, there's an enabler out there. There's an opportunity that if, you've, if you think about any ecosystem where there are participants who are just connecting with each other, paperwork going around, things have to be signed, there's maybe lack of trust. It's a brilliant opportunity to build that type of application on top of a platform like this. Thank you.